Hi, hello. <laughs> hello, Marianne. Hello. Yeah, welcome to Belgrade, welcome to HIPCON. Uh, yeah, so there is something very interesting about you. You have some things named upon you, right? I, I do, yes. <laughs> okay, what's that? <laughs> Uh, so, back in the United States, one of my most favorite companies is called Sapan, and they are a social impact company okay. uh, that does work in Thailand, and I have a purse named after me. Okay. Yeah. Nice. So, uh, there's actually a purse out there called, like, the Marianne, and wow. so everybody go get it. Do you have that with you? <laughs> no, I have every other Sapan purse, Next but time. not that one. It's too tiny. It's, like, this big. Okay. Yeah. What about coffee? Ah, ah, that's what you were really getting at. So uh, back in the States, I actually helped open up a coffee shop. And uh, I have a drink mm -hmm. called the Unicorn. Unicorn, okay. And it's uh, actually made out of edible glitter. Okay. Yeah. And you can drink that, right? Yes, you can drink it. <laughs> okay, <I think>. awesome. <laughs> cool. Thank you very much. Uh, please. Oh, just start. The stage is yours. <laughs> well, good morning, everyone. Oh my God. So I guess we'll just dive right in, right? Uh, so it was interesting, who heard uh, Courtney Hempel's speech this morning? Raise your hand. So uh, my background's actually in management. And so I loved everything that she said. And I was talking to one of the organizers about like how awesome she was. And she just looked at me and she's like, so are you now afraid? And I'm like, yes, but the good news is, is I have a whole presentation on fear. So like, I at least have tools to get over it. So, oh, hang on. We'll just do that. So a moment of full disclosure and vulnerability. Uh, I believe it was back in August when HeapCon listed all of their speakers. And I decided to troll all the people that would be here because I wanted to see who else was going to be at this conference. And when I saw names like IBM and Microsoft and Samsung and WorkWarrior, one of those things was not like the other one. And so I actually sent my friend this text. And her response was simply, stop being afraid. Now, something that you all need to know about me is I'm the really obnoxious friend that believes that fear drives the vast majority of our bad behavior. And so I'll have somebody pouring their heart out over about what's going on, and I will stop the mid-sentence, and I will say, what are you afraid of? And they're like, but Marianne, I'm trying to tell you. And I'm like, no, seriously, stop. What are you afraid of? And so I think that my friends get great joy when they see fear in me and then have to go and figure out uh, and get to say the words that I say to them right back. So uh, I'm kind of weird in that I am obsessed with fear. Is there anybody else in the audience obsessed with fear? <laughs> Some of y'all, and then how many of you are like, this girl's like just crazy? That works too. So I want to tell you a little bit about the journey of how I became obsessed with fear. Uh, it was about a year and a half ago, and an accelerator over in the United States asked if I would put together a program about women in entrepreneurship, specifically with the uh, idea of talking about mindset and how to be successful. And so I started doing the research that I would normally do. I started looking at assertive communication. I started looking at having difficult conversations, confidence and negotiation. And what I realized is that we could not talk about any of these difficult things unless we talked about the underlying root cause of what makes these things so difficult, and it was fear. But here's the problem with fear. Fear is one of the most powerful words in the English language, but we do not give it the respect that it deserves. In fact, if you were to go onto Instagram, my most favorite inspirational place ever, when you look at things about fear, you find all of these inspirational quotes, like, the only thing you have to fear is fear itself, or the, you must face that thing that you are afraid of and do it anyway. Or how about the acronyms that fear means fantasized experiences appearing real? Here's the problem. When we don't give fear the respect that it deserves, all of a sudden we start to feel shame. And the reason that we feel shame is because, despite what society tells us, we are afraid. Now, through my research, 
I came up with a hypothesis. And the hypothesis was that 80% of our bad behavior is driven by fear. But one of the problems with this is that because we don't talk about fear and because we don't give it the respect that it deserves, we don't recognize that our behavior is driven by fear. Equally as interesting, if 80% of our bad behavior is driven by fear, doesn't it make sense that 80% of other people's bad behavior is driven by fear? Like, logically speaking, doesn't that make sense? However, when we encounter a difficult person or we encounter a hard situation, do we ever say to ourselves, oh, I bet that person is driven by fear? No. What we say is, oh my gosh, what a horrible human being. I hope I never have to see them again. Now, why are we talking about fear at tech conference? One of my most favorite authors, Brene Brown, says that the idea of not being good enough becomes fear, and fear leads to risk aversion, and risk aversion kills innovation. And if you are at a tech conference, can you actually go and talk about solving problems and not talking about innovation? No, not at all. So that's why we're talking about fear, so maybe that you can start to recognize fear in yourself. Now here's something else that I'm gonna challenge you. Remember how I told you that 80% of our bad behavior is driven by fear? What would your world look like if the next time your partner or spouse acted out, you extended grace and asked yourself, is that person acting out of fear? How about that difficult employee or coworker? Instead of just assuming that they were difficult, you extended grace and said, is this person acting out of fear? When we talk about fear and innovation, I want you to think about how, if you extended grace to other people and thought to yourself, maybe they are acting out of fear, you can actually innovate those relationships that matter most to you. Now, when I go and I talk about fear, anybody, this is audience participation, so shout out, what is the number one thing that people say they are afraid of? I heard it, what is it? Failure. How many of you are like, I'm afraid of failure? <laughs> okay, here's the thing. Remember how I said words matter? Failure is a ginormous word. And not only is it so ginormous, it can look a hundred million different ways to a hundred million different people. And so here's going to be my challenge to you. When it comes to fear, there are only five root causes. And the next time you say to yourself, I'm afraid of failure, I want you to cut that out of your vocabulary and I actually want you to put your fear into one of these buckets. So these are the only root causes of fear. The first root cause of fear, which I heard somebody over here say is death. Do I need to explain that anymore? Right, it's pretty self-explanatory. The second root cause of fear is mutilation. So here's what mutilation looks like. I'm afraid to go swimming in the ocean because a shark might attack me. If you think about a greatest fear being in a car wreck and your face hits the windshield, that's mutilation. Something interesting about fear of mutilation is all of your phobias lie here. So I'm afraid of dogs, I'm afraid of spiders, I'm afraid of snakes. That all falls under fear of mutilation. Now those two are pretty self-explanatory. It's the other three that I find to be absolutely fascinating. So the third root cause of fear is loss of autonomy. So loss of autonomy means I am afraid that my choices will be taken away. When I was a kid, my biggest fear was uh, being put in jail. Because if I were in jail, I would have to be sitting in my little cell and not be able to play with my friends. That was loss of autonomy. Loss of autonomy is I'm afraid I won't be able to do things for myself. If you're trying to figure out if somebody is dealing with loss of autonomy, they usually say things like, I feel suffocated around you, and I feel like I can't be myself around you. Do those phrases sound familiar? Guess what? It's loss of autonomy that's at play. The fourth root cause of fear is loss of connection. So loss of connection means I am afraid that I will lose the things or the people that are closest to me. Uh, do any of you all have that uh, fear that if somebody is running 10 minutes late, you don't think they're stuck in traffic, you think they're dead on the side of the road? Yep, that's loss of connection. I'm just going to go ahead and tell you that right now. Um, loss of connection is I'm not going to have a difficult conversation because I'm afraid if I have that conversation, the person won't what? 
like me anymore. Uh, fear of loss of connection is I'm going to act a certain way because if I act this way, then maybe they will like me more. That's all loss of connection. And then finally, the last root cause of fear is humiliation. Now, do I have anybody in the room that's afraid of public speaking? Okay, don't worry, I'm not going to ask you to do it. But let me ask you this. What's your name? Harry, I'm on oh, Harry, you're a terrible example if you're speaking. I won't use it anyway. Okay, we're going to pretend that Harry's not a speaker. Okay, that, no, okay. Somebody else that is not speaking, are you afraid of public speaking? Okay, thank you. So let me ask you this. <laughs> if I looked at you and said, I want you to do a five-minute presentation on any topic in front of a thousand people, you don't know those people, you're never going to see them again, would you say, yes, sign me up? If you prepare, okay, the answer is usually no in America. And uh, here's why. Because we're afraid that if we go in public speak, we're going to throw up all over ourselves. We're going to speak some language that nobody's ever heard of. And we're going to completely make a fool. Have any of y'all ever been walking down the street and you trip? And you look behind you to see if anybody saw you? And nobody did, but you go back to the office and you're like, oh my God, the most embarrassing thing happened. I tripped. And people were like, did anybody see you? You're like, no, but it was still embarrassing. That's fear of humiliation. Usually fear of humiliation is at play any time somebody says they will judge me. Okay, so now you know the five root causes of, of fear. So your first challenge is the next time you say, I am afraid of failure, I want you to break it down and put it into one of these buckets. Because when I talk to you about solutions and overcoming fear, if you don't have it in a bucket, they won't work. Now, something else I want you to think about. Remember how I said that fear drives 80% of our bad behavior and other people's bad behavior? Uh, in America, we have this phrase, opposites attract. And that means that uh, we are usually attracted to people that are the exact opposite of us. And there is a common theme that you see where people who have a deep sense or fear of loss of autonomy somehow fall in love with people that have loss of connection. So that means somebody wants their freedom. Somebody wants to go out and do whatever it is that they want to do. And they have mated with somebody whose deepest fear is loss of connection. So let me ask you this. Loss of autonomy wants some space. What does loss of connection do? Oh, no, they don't get, they blow up phones, right? They send texts, they ask things like, are we okay? Hey, can we hang out? Can I just stare at you awkwardly on the couch, right? What does loss of autonomy do? They say, get away from me. And so what happens is that when we don't recognize fear in other people, we only entrench that fear. And if we were to start to change the dialogue and we were to start to look at fear, not just as a person that's having bad behavior, but hey, let's talk about fear is at play. We can actually decide to change our behavior so we don't entrench that fear. So now you know the root causes, but here's the thing. So what does fear look like? Fear is really insidious meaning that it just doesn't show up and knock on the door, right? It doesn't say, hey, I'm just here. And so in understanding fear, it is really important for you all to figure out, when I am afraid, how do I behave? So here are some of the ways that we behave when we are afraid. First off, we blame others or we blame ourselves. So something goes completely wrong on a project, you point at Tom and you say, Tom is the reason that that went wrong. It is quite possible that fear is at play. How about, have any of you all ever taken ownership or blame for something that wasn't yours to take blame for? It's quite possible. That is fear. Another thing, how we behave. Uh, we doubt or mistrust ourselves. So have any of y'all been really excited about an idea or an interview or a trip or something like that? And then all of a sudden you start to second guess, should I be doing this? Yeah, guess what that is? It's fear. Another way that we behave when we're afraid. Y'all, we lie. Has anybody ever told a lie? No, never, right? Well, here's the deal. Unless you are a sociopath, anytime you lie, you are afraid. Why do children lie? Because they're what? Afraid they're going to get in trouble. You're going to take away their toys. In other words, it's loss of autonomy that's at play. 
Another thing that we do, we become defensive and we feel like we are always on attack. Does anybody in the room have a hard time receiving feedback? Uh-huh. Now, good feedback, yes, right? But when it comes to like, hey, that didn't quite work, that's really, really difficult for us. Oftentimes, when that's at play, guess what? You're afraid. You're afraid that the other person doesn't think you're good enough. You're afraid the other person doesn't think you're smart enough. Another thing that we do when we are afraid, we do not say or do something. In other words, difficult conversations. You're in a meeting, you see something clearly wrong with a plan, but instead of saying something, you do what? You do nothing and you stay silent. Usually this is fear. And the last thing that I have seen in human behavior is when we are afraid, we procrastinate. So in other words, you do everything other than what it is that you are supposed to do. Now, I'm going to bet that there are other human behaviors out there that you act when you are afraid, but here's going to be my next challenge to you. I want you to think about the last time you were afraid and look specifically at your behaviors, because if you can recognize when I procrastinate, I am afraid, then that's going to be a starting point for you to ask that really big question of what am I afraid of? So we get it. Cool, Marianne, thanks, I know the root cause of fear. Awesome, I can recognize how I behave. But here's the thing that you need to remember. We are conditioned to embrace fear because it protects us and it makes us feel normal. So I have a question for you. At the brain's basic function, what is its job? Survival, right? It is there to keep us alive. And it is there to protect us from both physical and emotional pain. How many of you all, when you were a kid, were told that the stove was hot, but you touched it anyway? Raise your hands. I'm going to bet some of y'all that have your hands up still to this day will walk by a stove that you know has not been used in six years and you still do this. Why? Fear, because your brain created a story, and that story was every single stove that you encounter is hot, and therefore, I'm going to make sure that you test every stove before you actually go and put your hand on it. Now, we all get this, right? We get physical pain, but what about emotional pain? Anytime we encounter emotional pain, our brain creates a story around that. So the very next time that we encounter a similar situation, we bring up that story and we start acting out of fear. So I'll give you an example. Uh, negotiation. I remember my very first job I got, I asked if I could negotiate. And they said, yes, of course. And so I went to go negotiate my salary. And they called me up and they said, you know, we've really thought about it. And I don't think that you're the right person for this job. So we're resending our job offer. Uh-huh. What story did my brain create? Never negotiate again, because if you do, then they will take away what you want. How long do you think it took me before I started negotiating a salary? Ten years. Ten years. Now, just FYI, once you recognize this, I am a mad negotiator. So all of y'all that want some negotiation skills, I ask for the world. Come and ask me afterwards. So just remember, your brain is there to protect you. So here's what happens. We've got all these stories and we encounter a situation and immediately we see or hear something. Our brain creates a story around that. That story makes us feel a certain way and then we act. What is the time between hearing a story and acting? Like how long does that take? Two seconds, right? So there's not a lot of actually analyzing when we run into situations like this. And what's really important when we talk about overcoming fear is recognizing those stories that we tell ourselves. Because it isn't until we recognize the stories that we are saying that we can change those stories. So, fear thought patterns. 
In other words, what are the stories that we tell ourselves? Well, first off, we awfulize. Anybody know what awfulizing is? Oh my gosh, I'm going to go up for that job interview. I'm not going to get that job interview. I'm going to throw up all over myself. They're going to start tweeting out what a horrible human being I am. And I'm going to be like jobless for the rest of my life. Sound familiar? That is awfulizing. Uh, another thing, another thought pattern that we have is uh, called an intellectual response. And so what that is, is uh, we say to ourselves, well, there's no reason to go out and try something new because it won't work anyway, because it hasn't worked for other people. Does that thought pattern sound familiar to any of you all? Yep. Who am I to solve that problem that's never been solved before? Finally, the last thought pattern that we have are automatic thoughts. Well, I'm not going to go to apply for that job because I won't get it. I'm not going to go and try to solve that code problem because nobody else has solved it in the past. I'm not going to go ask out that hottie because they're going to say no because I've been turned down in the past. We all have these automatic thought patterns. And part of overcoming fear is recognizing those thought patterns so that we can change them. Now... There's an ongoing conversation among the different factions of your brain. So the rational part of your brain that helps you make good choices is housed in one part of your brain. And then the fear or the survival piece is housed in a different part of your brain. Now let me ask you this. If going unchecked and you have rational against irrational, which one wins? Irrational, right? All of a sudden, we start awfulizing. All of a sudden, we start to justify our bad behavior. We don't do things. What's really important to understand is that when you are faced with fear, if you don't actually think about those thought patterns and give your rational brain space to start working again, then you are always going to live in fear. So we all know this about fear, right? I just explained it to you. You guys are probably, you're smart people. You're like, yeah, logically speaking, I get it. So the question is, why do we self-sabotage with fear? By the way, time out, totally marry an extra. That's my puppy. Isn't he adorable? Yeah, he's a mini golden doodle. They don't have those over in Europe. I've been asking everybody. Anyhow, <coughs> here's the number one reason we self-sabotage with fear. Because it is familiar. And if given the choice, we will always choose comfort over happiness, period, paragraph, because that feels good to us. That feels normal to us. In the startup world, the other reason that I see people self-sabotage with fear is this thing called imposter syndrome. Has anybody experienced imposter syndrome? Yeah. No. Yes, the whole idea of imposter syndrome is the higher I rise, the farther I have to fall. I'm going to go to Belgrade and speak and share a stage with IBM. What if they find out that I do not know what I am talking about? What if I am not as good as I have been told I am? That is imposter syndrome. And it is something that affects not just females, but also males. So, here's why you're really here. What are we gonna do about it? Well, from here on out, here's what I want you to remember. You are a gladiator, and gladiators don't run, they fight, and they slay dragons. Do you have any Scandal fans in here? Right, I have to quote Olivia, I have to show my puppy and quote Olivia Pope, right? I mean. And Brene Brown, I know, right? Yes, I think that you're my new best friend. Yeah, you're welcome. Uh, anyhow, right? So what I wanna do right now is talk to you all a little bit about what can you do when you are afraid? How do we get that rational brain working again? The very first thing that you can do is figure out what you are afraid of. Now I need you to hear me out. It needs to be what you are afraid of, not why are you afraid. And this goes against conventional wisdom, but here's something that I want you to think about. When it comes to creating a negative thought, it only takes 
30 seconds for the brain to have a negative impression. So when we ruminate over something, why am I afraid? Every 30 seconds that you think about that, you have created another negative impression and all of a sudden you have entrenched your fear. So don't worry about why are you afraid? Why are you afraid of that spider? Why are you afraid of that interview? Don't think about that. But what I do want you to do is start thinking about what am I afraid of? The next thing that you can do, rewrite the story. So if you know that you think about something and you are afraid that if you go and have that difficult con conversation, the person may not like you anymore, rewrite that story. What could actually happen if I go and have that difficult conversation? Could this relationship be better? And if the other person doesn't receive that difficult conversation, is this even something that I need to be in? So really ask yourself that. Third thing you can do. Find somebody that doesn't have that fear and watch how they behave and then emulate that behavior. Yesterday I was talking to one of my new friends from the conference and he said, I am so afraid of interviewing because I'm a tech guy and people automatically assume that tech people don't have good communication skills and it totally freaks me out. Well, okay, if you have that fear, go find a tech person that is amazing at communication. Actually write down what it is that they do and then start doing that yourself. The best way to learn a new behavior is to actually watch it in action and then emulate that behavior. Next thing that you can do if you are afraid, tell someone, say it out loud. Secrets breed fear and they have power over us. But if you actually go up to somebody and be like, yo, I totally gotta be real with you. I'm getting ready to go travel to Belgrade. I have no idea if I'm supposed to take a taxi or cargo or is it illegal for Uber? I don't know. Then by talking about it, what you're actually able to do is say it out loud and you'll realize that that fear isn't necessarily uh, as big as you thought. And then finally, my last tip for you is, is that true? Now I did choose to use the unicorn emoji, one, because I do have a coffee drink called the unicorn made out of glitter, but also because when it comes to overcoming fear, this formula right here from one of my favorite authors, Byron Katie, can really help you dissect that fear and figure out, is this a rational fear or is this an irrational fear? So after you have identified a fear, the very first question you want to ask yourself is, is that fear true? I remember one time I was asked to go present on a military base. When they found out that I had no military experience, they were like, oh, I don't know how we selected you. I'm not sure you're really qualified. And all of a sudden I was afraid, right? Afraid that I couldn't do it. So the question that I asked myself was, Marianne, is it true that you are unqualified to go teach U.S. military? Well, the truth be told is I hadn't done it before, so my response was, I don't know. That's perfectly okay. I don't know. So the second question I asked myself is, what evidence do you have that that is true? Because isn't it interesting that when we bring evidence into our fear, we very rarely have little. And so here's what I came up with. Well, Marianne, over in the States, you have trained over 15,000 people. And I'm going to bet some of those people that you trained were military. And never once has anybody said to you, Marianne, you are not qualified to train us because you do not have a military background. So in other words, I had zero evidence that this fear was true. Next question you ask yourself, how do I feel when I think that that fear is true? So how do you think I felt when I was actually sitting here thinking that I might not be qualified for this? Like crap, I'll just say it, right? I had complete brain blocks. I couldn't figure out how I was going to do the training. I had no idea how I was going to present this. So how do you feel? Next question. When you don't believe that fear is true, how do you feel? So if I th think to myself, oh my gosh, what an amazing opportunity to go train people that are doing really important things, how do you think my mindset changed? All of a sudden I was excited, right? I was like, oh my gosh, I'm going to go do this. I'm going to go be awesome. I'm going to go be a rock star. Now here's the really big question. What do you choose? Who has control over your feelings? 
You do. We like to think that other people have control over our feelings, but that's not true. We are the ones that control our feelings. So while this question is very simple, it is also one of the hardest questions to answer. And that is, how are you going to choose to feel? Are you going to choose to be afraid or are you going to choose to not be afraid? I know that y'all are tech people and you love really tangible things. This is the most tangible tool that I can give you. Because as soon as we start to bring in evidence, and as soon as we start to realize we have a choice in how we feel, that's when we can decide to act despite fear. So here's the thing. I want you all to go out into the world and I want you to be gladiators. I want you to go and extend grace to other people and realize that when we are afraid and we act out of that fear, we will never have innovation. I want you to realize that when we start to extend grace to other people and think to ourselves, maybe they are afraid as well, then you can start to innovate not just in your career, but also in your personal life. I'm done. I know I got four minutes left, but I'm done. <laughs> uh, seriously, I will be hanging out there. I, I seriously am a freak over this. And so if you have any questions on fear, please come and find me. Uh, I will talk to you all afternoon. Except you only have 10 minutes before you, Henry, Harry comes and speak and you need to hear him speak. <laughs>